Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium of the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Don't forget to join us here tomorrow for the Medgar Wiley Evers Lecture with Moss Point native and Princeton University professor Eddie Glaude Jr., author of the New York Times bestseller, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. The Evers Lecture will take place at 6 p.m. here in the Nielsen Auditorium. Admission is free with no tickets needed. I hope we'll see you all tomorrow. And then come back next Wednesday for History's Lunch when Katie Blunt and Jerry Nash will discuss their articles in the new issue of the Journal of Mississippi History on the changing of the Mississippi flag. Members of the Mississippi Historical Society receive the journal as a benefit of membership, but we will have copies of it for sale that day as well. Today, we are delighted to have Katie Mills and Irma Hale to discuss the life of Irma's father, the artist Reuben Hale. Irma Hale is the president and founder of the artwork of Reuben Hale in West Palm Beach, Florida, where she is also a theatrical electrician and photographer. Hale trained as a dancer, pianist, and physicist, then toured as a showgirl and aerialist with the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. In 1999, she traveled to Antarctica to join the U.S. Antarctic program at McMurdo Station, where she worked as an electrician to set up research facilities on the ice and discovered her passion for outdoor photography. Katie Mills is executive director of the Museum of the Mississippi Delta. Mills earned her BA in English from the University of Mississippi and her JD from the Mississippi College School of Law. She served as staff attorney for LaFleur County Chancery Judge jo John Barnwell and attorney for the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians before operating a private practice in Greenwood. We'll hear first from Katie Mills, then Irma Hale will join us remotely from Florida. Uh, the Museum of the Mississippi Delta had a fabulous exhibit of Reuben Hale's art, and um, that was how I had learned about it. It was terrific. Uh, Katie did a great job putting all that together, and um, look forward to hearing from both of them. Help me welcome Katie Mills. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank you all for coming today, and I want to thank um, MDAH uh, and Chris for inviting Irma and I to come and speak to y'all. Um, as Chris says, I'm the executive director of the Museum of the Mississippi Delta, and as he read our biographies, um, Irma's, as you could tell, was much more interesting than mine. Um, uh, an aerialist, a physicist, Antarctica. Uh, she's, uh, she's done lots of things, and uh, she herself is a very interesting person. So um, for those of y'all that don't know much about uh, the Museum of the Mississippi Delta, it was founded in 1969 as Cottonlandia. Um, and about 10 years ago, the board of directors uh, made the decision to change the name to the Museum of the Mississippi Delta to better reflect our mission. Um, while agriculture was certainly a large part of our museum's collection, it, it didn't encompass all that the museum had to offer. Um, and and one, one example of that is that the Museum of the Mississippi Delta is one of the largest regional um, art collections in the Mississippi Delta. I think it is the largest regional art collection in the Mississippi Delta. Um, and so one factor that contributed heavily to um, to the fact that our our collection is so vast considering the size of our museum. Um, it, it happened a long time before the museum opened in 1969. Um, in the first half of the 20th century, there was a community of artists in Greenwood um, whose influence is still, still felt today. Um, these artists fostered um, a community that created not only artists, but um, patrons and collectors of art as well. And many of these collectors donated magnificent pieces to their um, of their collection to the museum and so that is one of the reasons why um, we do have this collection is is the generosity of the people who were influenced by a lot of these artists in the first part of the the 20th century um, during this time in history probably um, I would say the the uh, mid 
1915, 1920, um, until right after World War II, um, there was pretty much always an exhibition to see, an art exhibition in Greenwood to see. Um, if you look through old issues of the, the Greenwood Commonwealth, I mean, you'll see that there was always something available for people who were interested in the arts. And, and these shows weren't just the local artists in the community. They were... Um, they were artists from other parts of the state, and those local artists in our community really made an effort to, to, to get these artists from all over the state and even the country to come and expose, um, you know, our little, as William Fawner says, potion stamp of the world, um, to, to offer them a little, little taste of something that they um, hadn't seen. And we take for granted now how remarkably easy it is to gain access to information um, and so thinking back about how they were able to expose the community to such a large art world um, really is, is quite remarkable. Um, and at the museum, what we strive to continue that tradition of, of fostering the arts by making it a priority to provide a platform for emerging artists to exhibit their work. And while Ruben... I call him Reuben because that's what his daughter Irma calls him. So um, she always refers to him as Reuben. And so as I got to know Irma, that's how I refer to him as well. Um, but uh, and although Reuben was certainly not an emerging artist, um, we, do, we do strive to make sure that local artists in our community are able to exhibit at our museum. And we do provide spots. Um, throughout the year for them, so they do have an opportunity to to showcase their um, their work. And uh, one one area is is minorities who typically haven't um, don't really know how to get their feet in the door. We've been able to to offer them some guidance as well, and um, some you know some resources to market their art um, and hopefully uh, get their feet in the door as well. So a lot of these artists that I'm talking about in the first part of the 20th century, um, they taught classes to, to adults and children. Um, in fact, both of my sons take art um, from a Greenwood artist, David Taylor, who was taught art by Madame Wach. Um, and she was a German immigrant who moved to the United States in 1930 um, and was educated at the Art Institute of Chicago like Reuben was. Um, and she, uh, she lived in Greenwood for years, taught many, 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 many children and adults art and um, was very well known. But she also studied with Carl Wolf and Malcolm Norwood and Ralph Hudson at Allison's Art Colony in Madison County. And... Um, that in and of itself is a remarkable uh, story, Allison's Art Colony. And if you're interested in learning more about that, um, Petty Carr Black's book, Art in Missy, Mississippi, gives a wonderful synopsis kind of of that colony and how it was created and some of the, the Mississippi artists that, um, that, that studied there and worked there. So um, another artist whose impact was tremendous um, in our area was Lala Walker Lewis, and Miss Lewis was born in Greenwood in 1912. She was a painter and a printmaker, and she worked on several WPA art projects, um, and the, the woodcuts that she produced during this time are really, really remarkable, and we're fortunate to have, um, have quite a few of them in our collection at the museum. Um, so last year I curated a retrospective of Miss Lewis's work and, um, and this also included the murals that she completed for the old Carnegie Library um, in Greenwood, which was a WPA project. Thankfully, um, someone had the foresight to take the murals down and had them restored and they were sitting in storage at the courthouse. So um, those two murals are the only two remaining murals of hers that we know of that are in existence. And they were certainly a highlight of, of the exhibition. Um, and so uh, this is kind of where Irma comes in. Uh, Miss Lewis's um, exhibition kind of piqued Irma's curiosity. And um, Irma's father, Reuben, grew up in Greenwood. And from an early age, it was evident that, that he was a gifted artist. I, I, I think he probably could draw better the first time he picked up a pencil than I could if I had studied my entire life. I mean, he was just incredibly gifted. Um, 
Irma actually knew Miss Lewis when she was a child, and she made a trip to the museum from Florida to see the exhibit. And it was during this time that she began telling me about her father and his work, and I, I was absolutely captivated. Um, I had I'd never heard of, of Reuben Hale, and... Um, I can't believe I hadn't, and a lot of y'all may not have either. So that's one of the reasons why we're so glad to get here and get in front of y'all to expose y'all to, to his work. So um, she began making plans to to get his work to Mississippi, and so uh, she went to Florida and started having crates made. And uh, in February and March, in the very first part of April, we had an exhibition of Ruben's work at the museum. Um, but these, I, I kind of tell you this background about some of these artists in Greenwood to kind of tell you of, of how this remarkable community of artists impacted and continues to impact, uh, the art world in Mississippi and beyond. Um, in fact, an entire lecture could be given on this, this topic and maybe that's for another time because today we want to focus on Reuben. Um, who was undoubtedly impacted by this diverse community. And um, not only was he impacted, but he has the distinct honor of being a member of it as well. So um, without further ado, I will let turn it over to Irma and let her talk to you about her father. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good afternoon. Good I afternoon. cannot tell you how thrilled I am to be here today. Uh, I have had a long history with the uh, Mississippi uh, archives because I've come there for years to do genealogy research. So I'm quite accustomed to your building. Unfortunately, I'm here now. Um, I hope that many of you in the audience got to go to Greenwood and see the exhibit while it was there. But for those of you who didn't, here are a few images. And is my screen shared yet? No. And it's not. Okay, there. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Here are a few images of what you missed. And this isn't working now. Okay. I really want to thank Katie Mills and the staff at the Museum of the Mississippi Delta for giving us this opportunity to have this exhibit in Ruben's hometown. It meant the world to me, and I know it would have to Ruben as well. As I go through my presentation today, I'm not going to talk about every single image. There is such a vast body of work that I want you to just enjoy the images as I talk about Reuben. I would like to introduce you to Reuben Hale, my father. He was an artist you possibly have never heard of because like so many artists, he just wanted to work. He just wanted to create. So he didn't do much as far as getting his work, his name out there, he didn't care. He just wanted to make the sculpture. Reuben was a driving force who never stopped working and thinking. He accomplished so much, as you will see. All the while, he remained a lovely and soft-spoken Southern gentleman. Reuben was born in Belzona, Mississippi, but his family moved to Greenwood when he was about six or seven years old. I think that Reuben was always an artist. When he was in the second grade, one of his teachers entered, entered one of his drawings in an exhibition. It won first prize. The first prize was a college scholarship. He learned that he was a seven-year-old. What happened to that drawing? It was, I think, supposed to be an Indian on horseback, if I remember correctly, but it never came back home. However, we have a few images of his early years. 
He did a whole series of birds when he was about eight years old. Eight. There are around 50 of these birds, but here's a small sample. There really wasn't anywhere in Greenwood to study art. And the library only had two books on art, neither of which was very good. Ruben's mother gave him a few art lessons with a local artist, as you heard, Ms. Lala Walker Lewis. She was very good, but somewhat bohemian, so his mother didn't like that and didn't respect her very much, so she wanted Ruben to quit. Lala also introduced Ruben to Eudora Wealthy because they were working together on a WPA project. When Ruben would sneak over to Lala's house to show her his artwork and get her comments, Eudora Welty would also critique his work. Of course, he didn't tell his mother any of this, so she, he knew she wouldn't like it, but he didn't trust anyone else but Lala. When Ruben was 12, he dug up some clay at his grandmother's house near Paris, Mississippi, and started working on a bust of his father. Every day after lunch, his father would pose for him for about an hour or so. And here is the finished work. Ruben, this is Lala Walker Lewis. It's the only good photo that I have of her. And I remember her very well. She lived catty corner behind Ruben's mother in Greenwood. Um, and we used to spend a lot of time there when I was a little girl. Of course, Ruben had his own mind by then and could do what he wanted. Um, anyway, Ruben didn't focus only on art. He was very well-rounded in many things. He was a highly decorated Boy Scout and a Sea Scout and worked his way up to Eagle Scout. He also played the cornet in the band and was called on many times to play taps at veterans' funerals in Greenwood at the cemetery. In high school, he was the art editor for the school newspaper, the Bulldog Broadcast. One of his woodblocks was used in the newspaper at Christmas. And of course, snow was only just another medium for Reuben to work in. People of Greenwood regularly commissioned Reuben for sketches, lettering, and illustrations for school clubs, churches, parades, and other organizations all over town. Reuben did two images of Chief Greenwood LaFleur's home and carriages, and they have been used on postcards throughout Mississippi. I believe that the Mississippi Department of Archives and History has them for sale, or at least they did a few years ago. By the time Reuben graduated from high school, the world was in the throes of World War II. Reuben joined the Navy and was stationed in the Philippines. After the war, he came home and went to Ole Miss on the GI Bill. At that time, Ole Miss didn't have much of an art department either. So he finally left and went to Chicago to the School of the Art Institute to finish his studies. Several of his drawings from his classwork at the Art Institute survive. There are over 300 drawings that I have here at the house that he did while he was studying at the Art Institute. It's very interesting to watch his progression as we go through all of these. I won't bore you with all 300, just a small sample, I promise. Finally, he was able to get good classes in drawing, painting, sculpture, anatomy, and many other things that he had wanted all of his life. I'm not sure exactly when, but during his years at the Art Institute, Ruben spent a lot of time in New York City. Of course, he would hang out at the Cedar Tavern, which is in the East Village, which is where Willem de Kooning, Jackson Pollock, Franz Klein, Robert Motherwell, Mark Rothko, and so on, many other abstract expressionist artists also hung out there. 
This was supposedly a real dive of a place, but the drinks were cheap and it was comfortable enough. There are many tales of raucous ballroom brawls. Jackson, po Jackson Pollock eventually got thrown out of there. It's easy to see some of the influence these artists had on Rubin's work at that time. During this same time, Rubin studied privately with Paul Berlin, Hans Hoffman, Al Newbill, and also studied sculpture with Rubin Nakian. In the same neighborhood as the Cedar Tavern in the East Village was another pub that was frequented by writers and poets called the White Horse Tavern. Quite often they would cross between the two places. It was during this time that Reuben got to meet the poet Dylan Thomas who was a regular there. But unfortunately he died very shortly after that. While in Chicago, Reuben was waiting for someone in a hotel lobby one day when suddenly a lovely young lady ran across the lobby and threw her arms around him. That young lady was Marie Stoner from Greenwood, Mississippi. She was in Chicago studying ballet. Marie was six years his junior, so they had never met in school. But Reuben had been a very popular boy and Marie knew all about him. He took her out to dinner and the rest is history. They returned to Greenwood, got married and started the School of Ballet and Art. Oh yeah, and they had a little baby, me. The school quickly became successful, as you can see. They offered all kinds of art and dance classes. They would even drive to several other towns around the Delta and teach classes to some of the more underprivileged students. When Reuben and Marie returned to Greenwood to start their school, Reuben had all of his Art Institute training as well as the training from the East Village art scene. He immediately applied that to the Greenwood art community. It was what he had lacked in, as a child growing up in Greenwood. Both Reuben and Marie believed that students benefited greatly from not only training, but actually doing what they were aiming for. Together, they worked to stage large productions of full length ballets. This meant that Reuben had to design scenery and costumes and build it, build everything. And Marie had to stage and choreograph the ballets. Notice at the bottom of this program, student art exhibition in the corridors. Uh, everyone at the School of Ballet and Art took part in whatever field they were in. Ruben, here's Reuben building mouse heads for the Nutcracker. I don't know all of the ballets they did at that time, but these two programs still survive. Reuben and Marie were both very involved in other organizations around Greenwood. They worked with Greenwood Little Theater on many plays. Reuben designed scenery and costumes and Marie would choreograph or occasionally act in productions. This is a photo from Noel Coward's Blythe Spirit with Marie playing the spirit and Reuben's all the way on the right for doing the scenery. During this time, Reuben did a lot of portraits of people. I know that Reuben sold a lot of portraits and a lot of other abstract paintings that were sold all over Mississippi. If any of you ever run across a painting of his, I would love to photograph it so that I can add it to our catalog. Reuben was president of the Mississippi Delta Art Association and chairman of the arts for the Greenwood Women's Club in the late 1950s. He would invite Mississippi artists who had not previously exhibited in Greenwood to come and show their work. He would also invite lecturers from college art departments around the state to come and lecture for these various organizations. He had a whole series 
held in their studios. Ruben would arrange for his art students to show their artwork in various exhibits around the state. In exchange, they would, the, the school would show artwork from students from other schools around the state, having it shipped in and have exhibitions in Greenwood. Warren Brandt was a painter who had come to Ole Miss to start the art department there. Reuben had him to lecture in Greenwood a few times. By now, Warren was heading up the art department at Southern Illinois University and suggested that Reuben get his master's degree. He was able to get Reuben a full scholarship, so we moved to Carbondale, Illinois. Reuben studied painting, sculpture, and ceramics, among other things. The university also hired him to teach some classes as well. By the end of that year, Ruben had completed his master's and secured a job teaching in Florida. These are some images of the first bronzes that I know Ruben to have done. And some of the ceramics also from his time in Carbondale. Reuben had been offered a job with the University of South Florida in Tampa. However, they were renovating and weren't going to reopen for another year. So he got an interim job at Palm Beach Junior College. At the end of that year, Marie didn't want to move as she had found a great dance company to work with. So Reuben stayed at the junior college. He continued to create works of his own while teaching as he always had. When Reuben got to Palm Beach Junior College, he brought to this little place his Art Institute training, his experience with the School of Ballet and Art and the Delta Art Association, and also a Master's of Fine Arts and teaching experience from Carbondale. And he consistently applied all of this to the Junior College in Palm Beach. It's what he knew it needed to be competitive as an art school and later in all subjects across the humanities. One of Reuben's students told me one time that he would never forget the day when Reuben drew an anatomically correct front and back view of a standing skeleton on the blackboard with chalk from memory. But Reuben knew how important it was to study anatomy if you ever wanted to be a figurative artist. In the early 1960s, Reuben was working with a commercial artist in Palm Beach. He would go over at night and help him get artwork completed that needed to go out in a hurry to go to press. They started talking about building an automobile made of fiberglass and put them on the market to sell to people who wanted to build sports cars on a modified 1956 Chevy chassis. They built a model which somewhat resembled a Ferrari. They started making molds of the car body in pieces that could be put together by anyone and attached, um, to, attached to the frame. They sold one body and made some money to put back in the company. Ruben's partner kept having a bad time with the fiberglass and resin, working it past its prime and causing it to start bubbling horribly. And I have images of the car, but I don't know where they went. So I'm... It, I apologize. Anyway, maybe at the end, I'll pull them up. Um, but the whole project didn't work out and Ruben pulled out. And five years later, the partner still making changes and had never sold a single car. In the meantime, Marie went on to start a ballet company of her own, Ballet Florida. The company was made up of 22 professional dancers from around the world. Under Marie's strong leadership, the company was known for classical as well as contemporary ballet. Marie strived to present innovative and new works by both renowned choreographers and emerging new talents. The company had an extensive list of longtime friendships with respected choreographers like Lou Conti, Ben Stevenson, Maurizio Wainwright, 
William Solo, Val Canaparoli, Robert Davis, Sean Lavery, and John Butler. For those that don't know, John Butler was a very well-known dancer and choreographer, also from Greenwood, Mississippi. The company toured most of the United States and even performed in Greenwood. They also toured internationally. To go along with the company, there was an academy of Ballet Florida where young dancers could learn and perfect their art. Many of them grew up to become professional dancers in both ballet and musical theater. They also had a dance outreach program which provided dance classes and dance wear to underserved communities. It was one of the first programs of its kind and became a model for other companies to follow. The professional dancers in Ballet Florida were some of the finest talent from around the world. Australia, Canada, Brazil, Chile, China, Cuba, France, Japan, Israel, Russia, Spain, Venezuela, and the United States of, the, of America. Two of Ballet Florida's dancers were invited to perform at the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. Most of the dancers stayed with the company for a very long time because of the positive work environment created by Marie Hale. She was always incredibly upbeat and happy, and it rubbed off. We could do an entire talk about her company, but we're here to talk about Ruben. In the late 1970s, Ruben took a sabbatical to go to New York and study holography at the School of Holography. The school was actually founded and run by Sam Moray, who at one time had been a student of Ruben's. Holograms are those, if you don't know, they're the, like the little image on your credit card of the dove that moves when you move the credit card and things like that. They are created by splitting a laser beam in two, directing half of the beam to the holographic film with mirrors and the other reflecting off the object to be holographed. The two beams meet at the film plate and after the film is developed, a beam of ordinary light shining at the same angle as the first creates what appears to be a three-dimensional image. Ruben always had plans to incorporate a lot of holo holograms in sculpture, but unfortunately, these are the only two he got to do before, uh, di before he died. It's impossible to show you in a two-dimensional image, which is what we have here, how much motion and depth appears in a hologram. It's as if the, the little figure in the box is actually behind the, the wall, but it's not. It's a sim simple, flat piece of film. Ruben believed that one of the most powerful sociological developments of the 20th century was the change in status of the female in society. He thought it was more significant than the changes in science and technology, primarily because it was more personal and emotional. He shows in his work, a female emerging through a membrane, showing no sign of turmoil or anguish, not bound in any way, but simply emerging comfortably and securely with internal strength. Many of his work carry out this theme, even including a full grown female embryo. I will show you multiple sides of this sculpture so that you can see more clearly the embryo shape. Ruben started working on this idea in the 1960s and continued with variations of it through the 1990s. In many ways, he was way ahead of his time by accentuating the strength and importance of women. Ruben liked the idea of artwork that appears to move. He started working with patterned glass because as the viewer moves, the image inside changes. If you watch this progression of images, as the viewer moves up, the face inside changes its entire personality.
And this crouching woman takes on a whole different appearance behind the glass. As does this figure in a box, similar to the female embryo you saw before, but this inside the glass. Unfortunately, he had to stop working with the glass because it had stopped being produced. It's not possible for this glass to be tempered, so they've changed the patterns, and the new patterns don't have the same effects. We're still looking for a company that might be able to pour some for us, but so far, no luck. While at Palm Beach Junior College, Ruben established art classes in all areas that were equal to four years training plus some graduate level classes, even though it was a junior college. He expanded the two-year associate program to a state-approved four-year Bachelor of Art program. He soon had a large number of advanced students in need of further study. So he began drawing three and four, painting three, and sculpture one and two. He built the most complete and best equipped art department in the state. There was an outdoor sculpture studio under a roof with a kiln and a fully functioning foundry for casting bronze. His department was able to purchase a new lithography press with several litho stones and two new etching presses. Ruben was first appointed chairman of art and music and not long after he became the chairman of all of humanities division, overseeing English, speech, foreign language, drama, music, art departments and other special programs. He was the head of the largest division on campus and was the only division head operating in the black. Their surplus helped support the other divisions. Ruben established and directed an internationally recognized contemporary art museum for the college. It housed a collection worth three to five million dollars, mostly donated by J. Patrick Lannan, who was a big collector who lived in Palm Beach. Ruben designed and directed the renovations for the Duncan Theater at the college. Within two years, it was operating at a profit with a surplus for the college. He hired a director to bring in several professional theater groups each year, which became a big moneymaker for the theater. And he helped to establish the Palm Beach Invitational International Piano Competition. He also set up a professional chamber orchestra to be in residence at the college with Thomas Garris as its conductor. Ruben worked with Tom McCartney and Jean Arant to create the Palm Beach Master Photography Workshops made up of internationally recognized photographers. People came from all over the world to attend the workshops. This brought in a lot of money for the college. There is a long list of cultural organizations that Ruben was involved with. And as you can see, he was still painting and sculpting all along. He never stopped working and planning artwork. That didn't stop until he died in 2018. So what is the future for Ruben Hale? We are turning his home into a uh, sculpture garden and museum. As if teaching, painting, sculpting, Chairing the fine arts division at the college and being involved with all the cultural organizations wasn't enough. Ruben also redesigned and rebuilt and renovated his home by himself. He even built much of the furniture that's inside. The house was built in 1925, so it's almost 100 years old. As Ruben got older, he wasn't able to do quite as much work as he used to, and so some areas of the house are in need of repair. That's what we're working on now so that we can hopefully open it up as a museum. That being said, I did come home one day 
to find Ruben on the top of a 40 foot ladder up by the roof, repairing some stucco that had fallen off of the outside of the house. He was 88 years old at the time. Needless to say, I was terrified, but I watched and he came down very carefully and very well, and I never said a word. We hope to open the garden area to the public in another year and the museum the following year. In 2019, we established a not-for-profit organization called the Artwork of Reuben Hale Incorporated. Our mission is to research, preserve, share Reuben Hale's artworks, teachings, and life story with the public. We plan to do this by working with art and conservationists to preserve and catalog his artwork. We will be working with arts and humanities historians to prepare and share materials with scholars and the public. We will be developing and executing an arts education program to benefit the community, as well as an arts education program for children. We are also planning a traveling art exhibit across the country and working with curators to get his work in museums around the country. We will also be working with museum planners to preserve and prepare the artist's historical home, art studio, and garden for visitors. Our vision is that more lives may be enriched after seeing Ruben's diverse art forms, a unique celebration of women's strength. Please check out our online presence. Our website is currently in need of an update, but I hope to be doing that this next week. I want to thank you all for coming and getting to know Reuben Hale, my father. Sorry. <laughs> and thank you to Chris Goodwin and the staff of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History for giving us this opportunity. I have to say, with all of the projects, artwork, school responsibilities, community functions, and other commitments, Ruben's number one priority was always being a parent. I came first. Whatever I needed, he was there for me. Always. Pardon me. I was so fortunate to have two of the most talented, intelligent, caring and loving parents anyone could hope for. And that is why I'm doing what I'm doing. So on that note, if anyone has any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Questions from the audience? All right. Not have questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to Mississippi to the Museum of the Delta so that Mississippians would know that not only black talent goes unnoticed here, but white talent goes unnoticed. Your <laughs> father was amazing in oh, what he, he produced. Was. Where are your parents buried? In Greenwood. Bless their hearts. Yep. Wow. Okay. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Greenwood is still partly my home, so. I know that there is a um, art festival in Palm Beach. Did he have uh -huh. anything to do with that? Um, do you know, I'm not entirely sure because I haven't finished research. You know, I spent my whole life with this man and I sat in his studio and talked to him while he was sculpting and building things and making things, but I wasn't paying attention. Why wasn't I paying attention? I was thinking about my own little teenage problems and whatnot. And now that I have to repair sculpture, I'm desperately wishing I could rewind the clock and learn a little bit. And I'm hoping some of it rubbed off with osmosis. So we'll see. 
I have a question for Katie. Katie, what was the local reaction like to the exhibit that was up? Did you have folks who came who remembered the Haleses and, and who had connections to them? Oh, absolutely. Um, a lot of the people both studied under both Mr. Hale and Mrs. Hale. They were, um, lots of people uh, took ballet and art from both of them. Um, I will tell you one of the things that stood out the most was all the little old ladies in Greenwood talked about how handsome Reuben Hale was. They did remember that. Um, and uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, his wife Marie abs was absolutely beautiful as well. So they were beautiful people both inside and out. But, yes, the community was um, just ecstatic to to see his work because a lot of them had not seen his work. He left and went down to Florida and was so busy there that um, they didn't know what he had been doing. They knew he was this tremendous artist and they knew he had all this talent and the cards that um, that Irma showed of Mal Mason and Grudel LaForce Carriage, we've been selling those in the museum for years and years and years that he did. And so no, nobody in Green really knew much about his sculpture. And uh, when they walked in and saw that, they were really blown away. And the pictures absolutely do not do it justice. Um, <laughs> the holograms were remarkable. Um, you know, my children just would come in and just look at them and just couldn't figure out, you know, how how he did it. So um, if you do have an opportunity, if you haven't seen his work, to see it in person, like I said, the pictures just don't, don't do it justice. When you walk in and see it, um, you really, um, you appreciate him even more. And if any of you are in Florida and we're not open yet, call me anyway and I will... <laughs> give you a little private tour. Don't worry about that. So I guess my question is, is there a plan for an ex another exhibit outside of what you're doing in Florida for your dad's work anytime in the near future? Not or in the near future, no. Okay. But hopefully, yes. Hopefully I'm going to have exhibits in a lot of places. But we're, uh, you know, it's all about money. You know, it's a nonprofit organization and it's all about fundraising and I spent everything we took in on our first fundraising drive to get everything to Greenwood the first time. So it's, it's, it's a long road, but we're, we'll make it. Uh, first of all, thank you for participating today. Uh, no. We're talking about uh, someone with a long career who was very prolific over all those years. I'm wondering how many previously undocumented, unknown pieces of his work you found since you have started your research. Um, not too many, but some. I, I would be at someone's house and they would tell me, I have one, a Reuben Hale painting hanging in my bedroom. I, that happened to me twice while I was in Greenwood. I met a lady at the bookstore who said that, and I begged her, please, can I come photograph it? And she very kindly let me do so. So that was great. So, and I'm hoping that it, things will come up. I know of, I know he sold a lot. It's, there's articles in the paper that talk about how many pieces he sold. So I just got to figure out where they ended up. Irma, do you have, <sighs> an idea of how many pieces he created over the years, how many sculptures are still around and are they? Well, let's put it this way. If you count everything, paintings, drawings, sculpture, whatever, that still exists, I'm pretty close to a thousand. Yeah. I have no idea how much is out there that I don't know about. I'm struck by it his ability across so many art genres. I'm, I'm having a hard time coming up with another Mississippi artist who was as uh, strong a, a painter, a, a sculptor, a printmaker. It's, it's impressive. Yeah, he did everything and he never stopped. He was always working. Yeah. Any other questions? We will have this video up, and so for anybody who didn't get a chance to get the URL down or the contact information, you can find it there. Um, this was terrific. 
Katie, thank you so much for the exhibit that you had at the museum there. Thank you for coming down today. Irma, thank you um, for showing us so many of your father's works and for, for telling us about your mother too. I mean, we could certainly have a program on her as well. Well, we'll do that maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Remember to come back and tomorrow for Eddie Glaude. Come back next week for Jerry Nash and Katie Blunt. For now, help me thank Katie Mills and Irma Hale for this fantastic program today. Thank, thank all of you guys, and thank you, Chris, for giving us this opportunity. Really. <laughs>